y'all, welcome back. I'm Mom and Dr. Jones, a board certified OBGYN, a mom to four, and today we're going through 10 things people wish they had known about pregnancy or birth before they got pregnant. I came across this BuzzFeed article recently where they had asked people that question. And as I was going through it, I thought some of these are not quite accurate. So we're gonna go through some of them today. If you're new here and you'd like to subscribe, we would love to have you. I talk about all things periods, pregnancy, and everything in between. Hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Let's jump into the video. So the first person says, after a C-section is complete, they administer Pitocin to start contractions. Your body still has to go through contractions to bring down the size of your uterus. Contractions, when you've just had major surgery on those muscles, is incredibly painful. No one, not even my OBGYN, who did the cesarean, told me ahead of time. While this person is exactly right that they definitely should have been told what medications they were being given, I think that the uterus would likely be contracting whether the person had Pitocin or not. So the uterus has to contract after delivery, whether that delivery has happened vaginally or via C-section, to reduce the size of the uterus and to close off those vessels that were growing the placenta and reduce bleeding. Now, we often do give Pitocin after a delivery in what is called active management of the third stage. So labor has three stages. The first stage of labor is the time from when labor starts up until the time when you start pushing. The second stage of labor is a time from pushing to delivery. And the third stage of labor is a time from delivery of the baby to delivery of the placenta. So active management of the third stage means giving some Pitocin during that time to help the uterus contract better. And this reduces the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. So why is that important? Well, postpartum hemorrhage is one of the top causes of maternal mortality around the world and specifically in the United States. So this is common practice and I definitely agree that people should know what medications they're getting, but that's the reason that it's being done. Your uterus would be contracting whether you had a vaginal delivery or a C-section and whether you got Pitocin or not, because that's how you don't have bleeding. But the extra Pitocin reduces the incidence of heavy bleeding. So the answer to this is we need better pain control. This person should have been given more pain medicines if they needed it, not we don't want the uterus to contract after it's been cut through. That has to happen. Number two, I wish I had known that hyperemesis gravidarum is a thing that can kill you. Hyperemesis gravidarum is a severe morning sickness and vomiting that can lead to dehydration and weight loss. I wish I knew that people wouldn't take it seriously until I was literally bleeding out from organ failure. Doctors and society seriously treat pregnant women so badly. I hate that this person has been through this because it definitely sounds like they had a bad experience and weren't taken seriously and hyperemesis on its own, even with a great healthcare team can be really, really awful. But I can't imagine how much worse that is if you feel like nobody is listening to you. Hyperemesis is a severe form of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. And it's not just typical morning sickness. It's often associated with dehydration. To get the diagnosis of hyperemesis, you have to have lost 5% of your body weight. So it is much more severe than just what you think of normally with pregnancy. It's also associated with an increased incidence of anxiety and depression, both in pregnancy and in the postpartum period. There's lots of risk factors for hyperemesis. The most frequently seen risk factor is you've had it in a previous pregnancy, you're likely to get it again, but not always. You can have it um, at a higher incidence if you have multiples, if you have something called a molar pregnancy, if you have a genetic risk. So if it runs in your family, you may be at a higher risk. There's lots of things that cause you to have an increased risk, but we don't know the actual like full on cause of hyperemesis itself. It's likely related to some of the hormone fluctuations, but it also seems to have some kind of like baseline nutritional component as well. And then a whole component that we likely just don't even understand yet. There are lots of treatment options, but they are not always effective in making you feel better. Sometimes they just are effective in like helping us limp along until you get done being pregnant. So it can be very debilitating. And I definitely empathize with this person because I've seen patients go through this and how horrible it can be. The general consensus is that in developed nations where healthcare is somewhat accessible, the mortality rates for hyperemesis are basically zero. So it can be very dangerous, especially if there's no treatment given at all. But most of the time, as long as you can keep someone hydrated, you might feel 
horrible for a long time, but the mortality rates associated with hyperemesis are extraordinarily low. Number three, around month seven, I developed pregnancy-induced asthma, which is a thing, and I was told it would disappear immediately after birth, but it stuck around for almost 10 years. I looked this one up because I had never heard of pregnancy-induced asthma, and there's actually no literature that says that you are at an increased risk of developing asthma in pregnancy. Now, that being said, you certainly are at an increased risk of if you have asthma, it getting worse in pregnancy. So most likely what happened in this situation is this person had undiagnosed or very, very mild asthma prior to pregnancy that they didn't know about and it just worsened in pregnancy. Number four, my second pregnancy messed with my vision. It caused such dry eyes that things were blurry and I went to the eye doctor and was told that it's uncommon pregnancy issue and would clear up eventually. It started to clear up when I started nursing less and it started about halfway through the pregnancy but didn't fully clear up until my baby's first birthday. Vision changes from pregnancy and the physiology changes that happen in pregnancy are actually relatively common. We see this quite a bit. People can get pregnancy-induced dry eye from lacrimal duct having less secretions during pregnancy, and most of this is likely thought to be hormone-related. Hormone changes can also cause blurriness from a variety of different things, and they usually are temporary. I don't know that I've ever seen them be permanent. This is absolutely something that can happen. The good news is that it's usually temporary, but definitely something that people can see. Dry eye, blurriness, just general vision changes, all of those things can be associated with pregnancy. Number five, epidurals don't always work as intended. My skin was numb, but I felt absolutely everything else. So epidurals are a wonderful option, but this person is exactly right that they're not always completely reliable. And most of the time they don't confer complete absence of pain. The way that epidurals are put in makes the medication kind of inherently uptake different in everybody just depending on individual anatomy. So there are some options if you have an epidural put in and it's not working at all. Sometimes the anesthetist can come back and take the epidural out, try it again, see if that helps. But I think having a good expectation going into labor that when you get an epidural, it should help some. And in very rare cases like this person's describing, it might help not very much or any at all, but most of the time you're going to be somewhere in between. Most people will get pretty good pain relief, but not total pain relief. Number six, I wish I had known about postpartum hair loss. I had my first baby three months ago and the hair loss is horrible. So postpartum hair loss is actually a really interesting phenomenon to me and it definitely happens. Most people experience this, but the reason why is so fascinating to me. So the hormonal changes that happen in pregnancy and the physiologic changes that happen in pregnancy make all of your hairs sync up into the same cell cycle. Most of the time you're going through life and all of your hairs are in different parts of the cycle. They're either in like growth or maintenance or ready to fall out phase. So in pregnancy, the ratio of antigen phase, which are hairs that are growing, and telogen phase, which are hairs that are resting, is a lot higher. And then once you are postpartum, that ratio reverses. And so you don't have as much hair growth and they're all synced up into the same cell cycle. So all of those synced up hair cycles, hair follicles, they fall out at the same time, like six to 12 weeks after delivery. So it's really not that your hair just all falls out. It's just that all the hair that you would have been losing gradually through pregnancy has decided to leave at the same time when you are postpartum. And I remember with every single of my deliveries thinking, yeah, actually this is the time that I'm gonna go bald, but it does stop, it does get better, and it is a normal physiologic process that can be extremely frustrating and sometimes a little anxiety producing if you are someone who loves your nice thick hair that you had in pregnancy. Hi, what are you doing? Oh, girl. Playing with Thomas? Can you let me film? You wanna go find daddy so I can finish what I'm doing? <laughs> Sorry. Number seven, water breaking being the first son of labor, like in every movie, only happens like sometimes. My water didn't break until I was about 15 hours into labor with my first child, then with my second, it only broke when I was ready to push. This is absolutely true. In fact, when we learn about the progression of labor, normal and abnormal, in medical school and in residency, water breaking is not even included. Like there's no place in progression of labor where water having been broken or not is normal or abnormal. That being said, 
your water breaking does help the process along in many situations. So some of the products of the water breaking and like what the cervix makes and the water being present there can stimulate certain hormones that can help labor to progress and help contractions happen. So a lot of times labor will become more intense after the water breaks, but it is definitely not a necessary part and it doesn't have to happen at any particular point to be normal. Number eight, when you go in for an emergency C-section, they are going to tie your hands and feet to the operating table with no explanation to you as to what is happening. So there is almost never a reason that your hands need to be tied down during a C-section and you should absolutely ask if that is something that happens at their facility. If you are awake during your C-section, there's no reason that your hands should be confined on the table. So please, empower yourself because of what I'm telling you now to ask if that's standard and to say that you don't want that. The legs part is important because when you are on the operating table after you've had a spinal put in, your legs could inadvertently move even though you probably won't be moving them. They could be moved by somebody else in the room who's standing there or just by muscle twitches or something like that. The legs are strapped on, not tied down, just so they don't fall off the edge of the table. Now, with regards to this person saying that there was no explanation as to what was happening, that is a massive failure of communication on the part of the medical team. I have no doubt that this happens, but it's absolutely not standard and it is unacceptable. There is always time to stop and tell you what is happening, even in the worst of emergencies. So if you are in this situation, it's always okay to say, stop, I need more information. Can someone please explain what's going on? I don't understand or nobody's communicating with me. You shouldn't have to do that. It should be default that your medical team is communicating well with you, but if it's not happening, it is okay for you to say, I need someone to talk to me. Number nine, back labor, severe back pain while giving birth was much more painful than actually giving birth. This is actually really, really common and we don't exactly know why some people get back labor and some people don't. There's probably an association with a baby that's OP or occiput posterior, meaning baby that is facing out, like the head is facing out instead of to your back, but it's not a one for one. Everybody with an OP baby does not get back labor and everybody with an OA baby where baby's facing like the floor if it came out, they don't always not have back labor. It's probably more likely in people who have back pain with the menstrual cramps. So if you get really bad back pain when you have period cramps, you may be more likely to have back labor, but we haven't exactly identified why this happens to some people and why it doesn't. But the consensus amongst patients who have told me that it happened is that it is way worse than actual contractions. So I, I believe you. Number 10, pregnancy brain is real. It's not a joke. It's not exaggerated. When you start forgetting, misplacing, and outright losing things, you can start feeling as if you're also losing your mind. I feel like I absolutely experienced this in my pregnancy as well. And I, I know how this person feels. I think I've talked about a story in this channel at some point where I had put laundry detergent in the dishwasher and I, yeah, anyway, that was my pregnancy brain thing. But the literature has debated back and forth over the years whether this was an actual thing that happens. The literature has found in many studies, including a meta-analysis from 2018, at least some development or some level of cognitive dysfunction or impairment that occurs during pregnancy. There's also some studies that look at the format of the brain matter, and there have been changes found in that during pregnancy as well. So. I believe that this is a real thing. I don't know that I can prove it with the literature just yet because it's kind of mixed on our outcomes, but I'm with you. I feel like this has to be a real thing. Interestingly, there's even a little bit of data on expectant father's brains and the changes in memory and cognition and brain function while their partner is pregnant as well, which is kind of fascinating. All right, y'all, I hope that you learned something today. I wanted to go through these because I think that some of them actually are super important for people to know before they get pregnant. But I also thought that some of them were maybe a little bit scary and not quite, um, medically accurate. So I just wanted to go through some of them. I hope that you learned something today. If you did, leave a like on this video. If you're new here and you'd like to subscribe, we would love to have you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. I will see you next Monday.